Good evening. I'm Andrea Green, Director of the Visiting Artist Program at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's lecture by renowned scholar and writer Lewis Hyde. We are thrilled to have Lewis Hyde present the keynote lecture for this weekend's symposium, A Lived Practice, on the occasion of the exhibition, A Proximity of Consciousness, Art and Social Action, currently on view at SAC Sullivan Galleries. A Lived Practice is organized by SAC's Department of Exhibitions and Exhibition Studies and made possible through contributions by the Federal Republic of Germany, the Goethe Institute Chicago, the Italian Cultural Institute of Chicago, the Salzburg Global Seminar, an anonymous donor, and the Illinois Arts Council Agency. Tonight's lecture is also supported by the Robert Lehman Foundation. Each year, SAC hosts some of the most compelling practitioners and thinkers working today to share their expertise and provide an incredible resource and inspiration for the school and the larger Chicago community. I would like to thank Lewis Hyde for taking the time to be here as we are honored to add him to our rich history of distinguished guests that have spoken at the school. I would also like to welcome and thank our out of town guests and participants for this week's symposium who have traveled here from over a dozen countries. We've had such a great response to register for the symposium, and we now have the opportunity to live stream the presentations in another auditorium at the museum. So if you have not yet registered and confirmed your seat for Saturday's programs, there'll be staff at a table as you exit this evening um, that can get you registered uh, for the live feed uh, flow over room. You can find additional information on a lived practice as well as a visiting artist program and our upcoming speakers by visiting SAC's website at sac.edu. At the end of the lecture this evening, we'll have time to take a few questions from the audience. Our staff will have microphones circulating for your use, so please raise your hand so we can get a microphone to you. So thank you again for joining us this evening, and now I'd like to welcome Mary Jane, ja Mary Jane Jacob, SAC's Executive Director of Exhibitions and Exhibition Studies, to introduce Lewis Hyde. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. When I mention Lewis Hyde's name to artists, the response is almost always, ah, the gift. It's said with an inflection of both reverence and personal meaning found. Books throughout time have had that power, but few are nonfiction. And that's the genius of a writer who can bring research into prose that also contains the magic of poetry. Such writing changes lives, and that's how it's been for over three decades since the publication of The Gift, Imagination, and the Erotic Property life of property. I'm a fan, too, of this author's trickster makes the world go round, mischief, myth, and art, for the huge cultural insight this book brings about in connecting ancient stories to contemporary practices. Artists as joint workers who work the joints of society. We have a, quite a few trickster artists in the audience tonight, and that's a good thing. Lewis Hyde's Common as Air, Revolution, Art, and Ownership is a meditation on a cultural commons. And in this, his knowledge of the values at the founding of this country serve him well. Their principles well worth revisiting. Common as Air tells us something, too, of the ongoing concerns of tonight's speaker, as will the politics within his forthcoming volume a primer for forgetting. Forgetting, that vexing human trait, has social dimensions. And in this new book, Lewis Hyde considers the virtue of forgetting, as with the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, to move past realities to future possibilities. A MacArthur Fellow, Lewis Hyde is an affiliate of the Madrina Humanities Center at Harvard and the Richard L. Thomas Professor of Creative Writing at Kenyon College. I could imagine no better person to open a live practice symposium on art and social practice and to open our minds than Lewis Hyde. I thank him for taking up that task proposed to him. 
And as part of the Live Practice program, we are also honored to have on view in the School's Sullivan Galleries the collaboration between Lewis and painter Max Gimblet. And now I'd like to welcome to the podium Lewis High. Thank you. This first slide has nothing to do with my talk. <laughs> it's John Cage and David Tudor playing with a bell at some monastery. <clears throat> but on the way over, I managed to twist my ankle. So I'm going to have a chair here. But one thing that Cage taught us is that whatever happens, you can turn into happiness if you figure out how to work with it. So. Um, so in the 12th century, <clears throat> there was a Chinese master, a Chinese Zen master, who uh, made a set of drawings and poems called the Ox Herding Series, which is a, a parable about how to conduct a Buddhist practice. And the first drawing shows a, a young ox herder who's lost his beast, and then in subsequent drawings he finds the beast and uh, tames it and rides it home and so forth. And ox herding has had many iterations over the years. A lot of people have done versions of it. And as some of you know, and Mary Jane just mentioned, Max Gimblet and I spent 10 or 15 years trying to make a modern American version with Max doing new paintings and I working on trying to put the poems into uh, English from the Chinese. And this is all on display at the Sullivan Gallery over on State Street. So to give you an example of the tradition uh, that we were working with, this is a a typical image, this is a 15th century uh, drawing by Shuban of the first image in the ox herding series. So the fellow has lost his ox, he doesn't know what to do, or he's lost his way in life. And when Max and I began to work on this, um, Max at first tried to do figurative drawings like this. I actually found we have a record of one. This is a, an early version of a drawing one from the ox herding series, but after a while, he figured out how to do a more gestural drawing that uh, more in accord with the, uh, the work that Max Gimblet does with Sumi ink and paper. This is um, Max's first image um, called uh, The Ox Has Been Lost. This is a wonderful, if you can see it here, a painting of a fellow who does not know what to do. <laughs> um, so, uh, we live in a country that for centuries has put a high value on individualism. And my talk tonight is meant to kind of interrogate that tradition a bit, opposing it with uh, trying to imagine what it would be to talk about the common self, something that's a little less individual. And I'm not sure if it's entirely obvious which of those two categories this ox herding series belongs to. I mean, the practice, the drawings and the poems and so forth actually have a kind of individualist feel to them. Um, there's only one person in the story until the very end. And I, there's a Buddhist teacher I know who says um, that in practice what you should do actually is uh, get, your, get to know your own mind before you start fiddling with other people's minds. He says it's like the safety instructions on the airplane. When the, when the oxygen masks fall, you should put yours on first before you put them on the children and other people. <laughs> so. But of course, getting to know your own mind begs the question of what the mind is and also who or what you are. And in this regard, some interesting things happen in the Ox Herding series after the sixth drawing. This is the sixth drawing um, in which the, uh, the ox herder has found the ox and is uh, riding him home. And um, the seventh drawing follows that. It's called ox forgotten, person remaining, and the texts say uh, the ox served a temporary purpose. It was just a teaching tool, and now it turns out to be empty and it disappears. And so the, um, the, more, the more figurative drawings show a person, a guy sitting by his hut in the woods uh, with the moon up. And, uh, so it's a person alone outside of his retreat. And then in the eighth drawing, uh, Max gives us, this is the traditional image. This is called an enso, the, the circle. Um, and the title of this one is Person and Ox Both Forgotten. This is a slice out of my forgetting work. In the 13th century, there's a, a Japanese 
a Zen master named Dogen. And Dogen writes famously, to study the Buddha way is to study the self. And to study the self is to forget the self. And to forget the self is to be verified by all things. <clears throat> so the sense here is that the more you try to study the self, the more it actually, the more you become intimate with it, the more it seems to disappear on you. And if the self disappears, then what happens next? So in the ox herding series, what happens next uh, is this. This is painting number nine. It's called Returning to the Roots or Going Home. And it usually shows a scene out of nature uh, like this. And actually, um, this drawing, when Max and I were working, we found a lot of old uh, sets of ox herding drawings. But one that we liked a lot was by a man named Jikihara, a 20th century Japanese um, painter. And um, in a way, Max's drawing is an homage to Jikihara. This is the way Jikihara's drawing looks. And, um, and then this is Max's drawing. So in a funny way, this is, this is an image of going back to nature. But if you know this background, it's also there's two different men in this. There's one named Max Gimlet and one named Jikihara making this. Um, so you could say that this is um, an image of uh, that after the self and ox are forgotten, you become aware of the world outside of yourself. But you could also say that this is actually a new image of the self. Um, for in this tradition, self-forgetting um, means realizing the equivalence between what you are and what other things are. And so the, our normal syntax where we separate subject and object falls away a little bit. Instead of saying, you know, I'm looking at the trees, you say something like, look, <laughs> here's some trees. Um, and that isn't all. So f the, the final drawing in the, in the canonical series is called um, Entering the Village with Helping Hands. And it usually shows two people. Sometimes there's a chubby guy named Hotai and uh, maybe the ox herder and uh, one of them is giving something to somebody else. This is Max's wonderfully simple version of this, but it still has this two-ness to it. Um, uh, we're beyond the individuality that the uh, series began with, and now things are beginning to expand. So I want to turn now from ox herding and expand myself on this image of entering the village what does it mean to go into the village with helping hands? Um, and to come at this, uh, well, what you see is if you're trying to move from this individual self to the common self, uh, this two-ness is just the beginning of it. So some years ago, we got the results of what was called the Human Microbiome Project. This set out to catalog <clears throat> all the bacteria fungi, and otherwise non-human stuff that lives inside the human body, that lives in us and on us usefully, helping us digest food, absorb vitamins, fight diseases. So here are a few surprising numbers from the Human Microbiome Project. Counting these organisms one by one, each of us, each of you, is host to about 100 trillion non-human life forms. <laughs> and each of these organisms, if you took them together, would weigh between two and five pounds. As one microbiologist put it, human beings are like coral, an assemblage of life forms living together. So the word individual actually means not divisible. And conceived in that way, an individual is assumed to be like the elementary particle of social life, the atomic unit from which we make other things. So the Human Microbiome Project did a nice, found a, gave a nice example of, in science of the way that that assumption of individuality can be called into question. In, in, you know, what, in what sense exactly are you and I individuals if we couldn't live without the scores of other beings that make our life possible? 
or let me now move now from science to social science. And anthropologists in recent years have shown an interest in splitting this individual atom also, and they speak about the individual self. So a lot of examples of people who worked in Micronesia uh, where they find that persons are not thought of as having the complexity of the social world outside of themselves, but rather inside of themselves. So by this notion, the, you know, your friends and your family and the animals you live with and the, the nature that surrounds you and the spirits and gods that you uh, worship or are connected to, all of these things are not just around you, they are actually inside of you. And they are part of what makes you the person you are. And if they were to disappear, so would you. Or at least you would not be the same person you were when they were around. So your, your identity is dependent upon this uh, surround of other things which are at least as interior as not. I had a chance uh, last week actually to meet um, a Navajo poet named Lucy Tapahanzo, who told me that um, when they set out to translate the Bible uh, into Navajo, they had a problem translating the word hell because the Navajo have no such place. And what they decided to do was describe it as being in a state in which all of your relatives have disappeared. <laughs> so you're not alone. You are completely alone. You know, in, in hell, there is no individuality. So again, we are a nation that celebrates individualism. And, um, but even that has not always been the case on this continent. And it's not just about Native Americans. In 1630, the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, John Winthrop, preached a sermon called A Model of Christian Charity, the one in which he famously imagined that um, the city of Boston might be a city on a hill and a shining example for other plantations to come. But if you read uh, A Model of Christian Charity, that sermon as a whole, you'll find it has nothing good to say about individualism. Here is just one of John Winthrop's sentences. He says, we must delight in each other, make each other's conditions our own, labor and suffer together, always having before our eyes our community as members of the same body. So for Winthrop, that was a religious creed, but it is also a individualist creed, the demand being that we live for and in each other, not by and for ourselves individually. So I want to move to the world now of cultural creation and begin with another bit of history. So even as John Winthrop and crew were trying to set up a city in Massachusetts, in, in Europe this was the period when printing was uh, spreading throughout uh, European countries. And along with that spread, there came a whole series of arguments and fights over the nature of what is to be found in books, and particularly over whether or not you could actually own the stuff that was found in books. Um, so printers in Scotland, for example, got into arguments with the printers and publishers in London because the London people claimed that they could own exclusive rights to a book like, uh, like or a book of oratory by Cicero, or a book, um, is a poet named James Thompson who was famous at the time for writing a book called The Season. So, so the idea was we, they could own it and they could prevent the, the printers in Scotland from printing copies of it. And there was one aggrieved Scotsman who explained his complaint this way. He says, if a writer were to keep his lucubrations to himself, then perhaps he may be said to have a property in his noddle. This is your noddle. <laughs> If a writer were to keep his lucubrations to himself, then perhaps he may be said to have a property in his noddle. But once he prints these lucubrations, and once someone else pays for the book and reads it, the person who buys has just the same property as the author had. So I'm fond of this quote partly because I did not know what a lucubration was when I first read it. <laughs> So lucubrations, uh, there is actually an ancient verb to lucubrate. And to lucubrate 
is to study by artificial light. So uh, your lucubrations are the fruits of your midnight meditations as you set up late with your candle as a student uh, writing your paper. Those are your lucubrations. So, and, and the Scotsman is complaining that uh, things that happen in the mind, once you divulge them, are hard to keep to yourself and make other people not have them. And he's not the only one. This was, in fact, one side of the arguments that were being conducted in the 17th and 18th century. And uh, in our tradition, um, the person who put this best is Thomas Jefferson. There's a famous letter from Jefferson, um, 1813. And he's, he's meditating on the problem of, of patenting things and copywriting things. And he makes the same point, but here's Jefferson's wonderful language. He says, if nature has made one thing any less susceptible than all others to exclusive property, it is the action of the thinking power called an idea, which an individual may exclusively possess as long as he keeps it to himself. But the moment it is divulged, it forces itself into the possession of everyone. Its particular character, too, is that no one possesses the less because um, everyone possesses the whole of it. He who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine, as he who lights his candle at mine receives light without darkening me. <laughs> People now call this, um, uh, these goods are non-excludable and non-rivalrous. <laughs> but Jefferson has a much better, uh, way of speaking. So, you, you know, in both this way Jefferson imagines this and the way uh, the Scottish printer does, there are, of course, people, and these are like little dramas in which there are people who have created things, people who are trying to disseminate them, people who don't want to, uh, everybody to have them, their publishers, their buyers, there's readers, there's books, and so forth. And again, we need to think how these people are imagined and how also the ways in which they're imagined lead us to then imagine how we treat their creations, uh, books and inventions and works of art. And part of my idea about this is that once we decide how we're gonna treat these things, we also then begin to enable or disable certain ways of being human. Um, you know, if it turns out that you can patent and keep other people out of uh, the work you're doing in a bio biology lab, it may turn out that it becomes more difficult to be a scientist working in biology. So these thresholds to the exchange of knowledge enable or disable certain ways of acting in the world. So this book that uh, Mary Jane mentioned uh, of mine called Common as Air takes this leaf out of Jefferson's work, um, his idea that the field of knowledge is our common property. And it uses this language of the commons as a way of uh, musing on this problem. So by the commons people traditionally meant uh, fields and streams and woodlands and so forth where uh, medieval villagers would have common rights to fish or pasture their cattle or um, cut wood for the uh, winter fires and so forth. But a lot of people have taken this uh, language and images of the commons and used it as a way of talking about cultural practice. And um, so we imagine that there is in fact also a cultural commons which is the great store of ideas and art and inventions that we have inherited from the past and that we continue to make in the present and which everyone has access to because no one has the right to exclude. So all literature from the 19th century, all of Shakespeare, all of Verdi, all of the invention of the discovery of penicillin or aspirin or any, all of these things are ours uh, without stint. Um, they are part of the cultural commons. They are common as air. So this is an old idea, but it was also one that mattered a lot to the uh, people who founded this nation because they believed that especially when it came uh, to inventions and to printing, um, you had to have a rich cultural commons. And um, in, in the printing world, uh, they understood the copyright grant not the way we think of it now. Now we think of it as I own a copyright and it's my property, but they thought of it as um, that the government decides to give you a monopoly privilege 
uh, to have this ownership. And, and if you s talk about these things as monopoly privileges, they take a slightly different cast. And particularly in the world of printing, their worry was that if people had monopolies in the printing uh, business, that they would interfere with the, uh, with the conversation that people needed to have, particularly that they needed to have to have a democracy. So the first reason that the founders thought that a cultural commons was important was that they were trying for the first time in history to set up a democratic self-governing nation in which people had to be able to talk to each other and have discourse. And, if, uh, and, and therefore these monopoly privileges were a problem or on the other side, the fact that you could treat things as um, commons uh, w was a benefit. Secondly, they also understood um, that a cultural commons was part of what enabled a lively creative community. And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about uh, Benjamin Franklin because he's the good example about how the community of science worked. But Franklin, just to give you one quote, uh, in writing about his own inventions, he used to ex talk about them in the language of gift exchange. He said that we enjoy great advantages from the inventions of others. We should be glad of any opportunity to serve others by any invention of ours. And this we should do freely and generously. So this was, a, this was the Republic of Letters. This was a world in which there was a republic that uh, wasn't just about land and voting, it was about discourse. And so finally, the third reason that, that a rich cultural commons mattered to the founders uh, is a more philosophical or spiritual uh, take, which has to do with the human self. Um, where do creative works come from? For whom are they made? And how should we think of the self that makes them? So I'm gonna say a little bit more about Benjamin Franklin to explore those questions. You know, Ralph Waldo Emerson has this famous essay called Self-Reliance. <clears throat> and if you're ever a little depressed and can't to get out of bed, you should read Self-Reliance to yourself. <laughs> it's full of these aphorisms about, you know, you can do it. And um, I'm fond of this essay, but it has a, a several, it has many nutty places in it. Uh, but one of them is, uh, he says at one point, he says, insist on yourself, never imitate. And then he asks rhetorically, where is the master who could have instructed Franklin. Every great man is unique. So, <laughs> if you know anything about Franklin's life, this is a bizarre statement. Uh, where is the master who instructed Franklin? Well, just to give you three examples. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton was one of the people who instructed Franklin. Franklin had read uh, Isaac Newton's Optics. It was a book that helped him greatly in his theorizing about electricity. When Franklin was a teenager, he read uh, The Spectator that came out of London and writers like Addison uh, taught him how to write, taught him how to make an essay. Um, or, you know, Franklin famously invents uh, a wood stove and he publishes a pamphlet about the wood stove. If you read the pamphlet, you see that he has read six different books that came out of Europe about how to make wood stoves. <laughs> and so, you know, he's working in a, in a collaborative work, uh, workshop with other people who are thinking about the same problem. And even when it came to his work on electricity, he was not reticent about the fact that he worked collaboratively. He, he had three pals who, uh, they set up a, a workshop in the State House in Philadelphia to do their experiments. And when Franklin writes to friends in England, he mentions this group that's working together with him. Uh, his theories were not his alone. They were part of uh, a communal effort to understand how electricity worked. So if you're thinking about Franklin, it doesn't make sense really to talk about self-reliance. It's better to talk about other reliance. And in this line, I'm very fond of a quotation that comes out of uh, Goethe, the, the German uh, poet and playwright. Uh, late in his life, he's talking to a friend and um, uh, he asks this, he answers the, his own question, what am I? And Goethe says, my works have been nourished by countless different individuals, by innocent and wise ones, people of intelligence and dunces. I have often reaped what others have sown. My work is the work of a collective being, a collective being that bears the name of Goethe. So how should we imagine the creative self? Is it 
individual and unique, or is it collective and common? So I actually think that this is a false question, that creativity always has this double nature to it, uh, that there's always some uniqueness, individuality involved, and there's also some collaborative uh, commonality. The problem is that in this nation, uh, and really since Emerson, um, the Emersonian answer trumps the other answers. Uh, and uh, self-reliance has a kind of luster to it that, that dims our view of these other possibilities. And we have this whole language of self-help and self-teaching and self-making. There's a wonderful thing, there was a woman named uh, Frances Trollope, she was the mother of the novelist Trollope, and she comes to the United States in the 1830s, and she's in a um, stagecoach with some other people, and one of the guys is saying, well, we have a wonderful painter in our community, he's self-taught, and Mrs. Trollope cannot figure out what this means, <laughs> because, no, because no painter in Europe would be self-taught. You would go and learn how to paint from painters and in museums and so forth. So, but we have this language, um, and we've made, you know, these uh, used to be transitive verbs. I help you, he teaches her, and we made them into reflexive, you know, I help myself, I teach her. So, <laughs> it, you know, if you start yelling help, you don't want somebody reading Emerson. You want people to show up. <laughs> um, you want individuality to come into play. So, again, this is not to say that, Emer that Franklin wasn't, uh, an unusual guy, he was of course, but it's odd to make him that and nothing else. And I wanna illustrate this with some Franklin iconography. <clears throat> this is a painting of Franklin from 1767. It's painted during his lifetime, he's in London, and it shows him in a sociable light. That's a bust of Sir Isaac Newton off to the side, and he's reading and uh, writing and so forth. So this is, not the self-reliant, unique Franklin. This is a guy who's involved in the Republic of Letters. And then, uh, I think it's about 50 years later, we get Benjamin West painting the famous kite experiment. <laughs> and so on, on the left here, Franklin's collaborators have been converted into balding cherubs <laughs> and they're playing with a Leiden jar. And on the right, there's another set of toddlers who help him fly the kite. So why has the passage of time turned Franklin's collaborators into baby angels? Because we are entering the age of Emersonian individualism. And for Emerson, it takes a child in nature to perceive these original truths. Here's Emerson. In nature, a man is always a child. In the woods is perpetual youth. In the woods, we return to reason and faith. So what artists from West to this day really have done is to strip Franklin of his great sociability and to turn him into one of these American boy men who go off alone into the woods and have an idea. Um, uh, whereas in fact, this is a guy who traveled greatly in Europe and read widely and um, is in fact sociable. So, in our mythologizing, we take somebody like Franklin and we strip him of his, individual, of his individuality and make him individual. So now I want to turn to a modern example of the same process, not in science, but in social activism. And this is the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. And it should be obvious that Martin Luther King knew himself by the social movement that contained him and by his collectivity in that movement. And since he died, something odd has happened. His heirs have made him into a different kind of person. So one of the most striking examples, I mean, they have commercialized Dr. King's estate is what they have done. And one of the most striking examples is they sold the rights to some video from the I Have a Dream speech to a company called Alcatel uh, to make a little advertisement. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, live up to me the street. Before you can inspire, 
before you can touch. That all men are created. You must first connect. And the company that connects more of the world is Alcatel, a leader in communication networks. I think a minute of silence is in order. <laughs> you just want to hang your head. So, you know, in a commercial culture like ours, there's nothing illegal about this, and also in a certain sense, nothing that surprising. There's a defender of the King Estate who says, I don't see how it's any different from Disney asking, saying, we own Mickey Mouse, and if you want Mickey Mouse on your pages, you have to pay for him. <laughs> right. But of course, it's precisely the erasure of the distinction between Mickey Mouse and Dr. King that needs to be questioned here. So to do that, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. King's lived practice as a minister and an activist and about how he made the speech. This is the I Have a Dream speech. So in the early 1950s, King was a student at a seminary in Pennsylvania and he took a class on homiletics, which is the art of giving a sermon, art of preaching. And uh, the students had different kinds of uh, sermons that they were learning how to give. One of them is called the ladder sermon. So you make a point and then um, in a simple form and then you sort of build it up and up and up like this. Um, I think there was another one called the, the jewel sermon where you keep coming at the point after again and again. But King and his classmates invented their own form of sermoning and they called it the rabbit in the bushes sermon. And what it does is to experiment with a series of phrases and ideas until the preacher finds out which ones the congregation responds to, at which point he begins to address the same idea again and again, the way a hunter might repeatedly shoot into the bushes to see if there's a rabbit. So this is a model in which, you know, famously there's call and response in uh, some churches, but this is a, a model in which the call and response, um, the, the response is not just a reflection. It, 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 it's helping to create the story that ends up being the final sermon. Uh, so whatever theme becomes the center is produced collaboratively, that the preacher and the audience are co-creators of this thing. And in the, in the I Have a Dream speech that King gives in 1963, uh, he had been developing this uh, way of speaking for years. And particularly the image of a dream as yet unfilled uh, he, it had become one of his set pieces. So he came to Washington having learned from previous audiences what rabbits are hidden in the American crowd and how to flush them out. Uh, so some people say if you, if you watch the last seven minutes of that speech, you see him, he, he's noticing what's, what he's getting back and he's working with the crowd. Um, and also Dr. King knew a great deal of political and biblical rhetoric by heart and the speech is full of uh, things, other people's languages. I mean, even in this little um, Alcatel thing, uh, a third of the words come from Thomas Jefferson. Um, so, <laughs> and you wondered if the Jefferson estate got part of the fee, but anyway. Um, he, uh, so there's a lot of other people's language in the talk. He, there's, um, Gandhi had this uh, image of soul force that's in there. There, there's a half a dozen direct lifts from the Bible. There's a long verbatim quotation from the book of Isaiah. And also all the themes in that speech are out of the tradition of African-American resistance and preaching. Um, in the beginning, he has this uh, image of a promissory note that has turned into a bad check. And this is an analogy that uh, you find in James Baldwin, it's in Malcolm X and other people. And at the very end of that speech, his, his closing refrain is, let freedom ring. And, and it's a refrain that was used exactly the same way by a guy named Archibald Carey in 1952 when he addressed the Republican National Convention. So, and also one of King's um, biblical references is worth saying a bit more about. Um, early in the speech, he declares that with faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. Okay, so this image echoes a line from the book of Daniel. 
in which the story is told of how Daniel, alone among the wise men of Babylon, proved himself able to interpret King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And Dr. King believed that dreams emanate from the mind of God, and we mortals merely relay them to others. And such was certainly how dreams were understood in the book of Daniel. And moreover, the dream that Daniel explicates turns out to reveal that the kingdom of God will triumph over the earthly kingdom. So what's going on is King is reading the American dream, and he's working into what's known as the typological tradition in which types, things that are in the Bible, turn out to foretell things that are gonna actually happen in fact. So I have dreamed a dream, says Nebuchadnezzar, and the founding fathers dreamed this dream, says Dr. King, and so he presents himself as one who has come before us, like Daniel, to make sense of something that the rulers themselves don't understand. It's as if, like Neb Nebuchadnezzar, neither the nation's founders nor its current political elite know how to read their own dream, and a voice from the captive population has to step forward and tell them. Or rather, the captive has to come before the rulers, not as an individual who has figured something out on his own, but as a messenger of powers greater than himself. Daniel only knew Nebuchadnezzar's dream because the Lord had revealed it to him while he slept. And as for Dr. King, early in his career, he developed the habit of going off into solitude and calling on God for help when preparing a public presentation. And this is a pattern that he repeated when, before he gets to Washington for the 63 March. He had separated himself from his advisors and gone off to counsel with the Lord. So what kind of person made this speech? I mean, you can call it an individual, but the more you know about how the thing was made, the more it becomes clear that the term distorts rather than reflects the world as it is. Martin Luther King made his oration from a mix of congress congressional confirmation, inherited material, and inspiration credited to God. The speech is deservedly famous as a high point of American oratory, and Dr. King is its maker. But the wit of its creation lies, first of all, in the social work of seeking the rabbit in the bushes, amplifying not his own ideas merely, but those of the audiences he's speaking to, and secondly, of his ability to absorb the surrounding spiritual and political traditions and reshape them to fit the historical moment. The genius behind I Have a Dream is the genius of a talented host of a collective or common being. We value privacy in this nation, and rightly so. But all good things have their other side, and privacy is no exception. The word has a root in an old English verb, to prive. To prive means to deprive, but it also means to strip of office or dignity, to depose, and the Latin root means to bereave, to be left alone, single, individual. So Richard Nixon, when he was forced from office, was prived in this sense. Or men in solitary confinement in the Tams Supermax prison in southern Illinois are prived. Men and women who lose their spouses are prived. In each case, the individual self, the individual self, excuse me, loses its complexity and becomes more individual. And those who have turned King's legacy into a commercial enterprise and guarded it with the right to exclude others have prived Dr. King, taking away the very thing by which he knew himself when he was alive, the social movement and the cultural commons from which his voice arose. So I've talked about uh, Benjamin Franklin and science in the way a scientific community uh, is enabled by having low barriers to the circulation of knowledge and treating ideas as belonging to a cultural commons. And I've talked about Dr. King as uh, a spiritual activist in the same way. 
So let me now take an example out of um, the art world or particularly out of music and song using the young Bob Dylan as my example. So Bob Dylan has an, a book, autobiographical book called Chronicles. And one of the wonderful things in it is that uh, he's very candid about the sources that influenced his work when he was young. Um, he tells, for example, a story about when he first gets to New York, John Hammond, who ran Columbia Records, gave him uh, an acetate record of Robert Johnson songs. So Robert Johnson, great black blues musician, had been only known on uh, race records and, and 78 RPMs. And Columbia had finally bought the rights to all these and, and issued the first one. And Dylan says um, he took it home and listened to it time after time, writing down Johnson's lyrics, uh, learning how he made it, the compactness of his, of his song. And the other story he tells is about going um, when he was in Minneapolis, he had left uh, northern Minnesota to go to the University of Minnesota in, I think, 1959. So he's 17 or 18 years old. He spends a year in the Twin Cities and is involved in the folk scene there. And uh, a fellow named John Pancock, Pancake in Minneapolis had a lot of Woody Guthrie records, and uh, Dylan had never heard them before. So uh, he finally gets to hear Guthrie. And here's what he says. I listened all afternoon to Guthrie as if in a trance, and I felt like I had discovered some essence of self-command, that I was in the internal pocket of the system, feeling more like myself than ever before. A voice in my head said, so this is the game. I could sing all of those songs, every one of them. So the young Dylan had a great absorptive ability. Another folk singer at the time, Eric von Schmidt, recalls the time that 19-year-old Dylan comes to him and his apartment in uh, Cambridge. And he says, he wasn't much interested in uh, playing. He wanted to listen. It was something the way he was soaking up material in those days, like a sponge and a half. And uh, Liam Clancy of the Clancy Brothers <clears throat> had the same impression. He says, do you know what Dylan was like when he came to Greenwich Village? He was a teenager. And the only thing I can compare him to was blotting paper. He soaked up everything. He had this immense curiosity. He was totally blank and was ready to suck up everything that came within his range. But of course, he doesn't just soak things up. He absorbs them and adds and subtracts and wrings himself out and makes something new. So witness the first time he recorded songs for his publisher. Um, the day he went to their offices, he writes, I didn't have many songs, but I was making up some compositions on the spot, rearranging verses to old blues ballads, adding an original line here or there. I would make things up on the spot, all based on folk music structure. Of the old song, 16 Tons, he says, you could write 20 or more songs off that one melody by slightly altering it. By his own account, Bob Dylan is not a melodist, he says, which explains in part the largeness of his debt to borrowed tunes. <clears throat> There's a musicologist at the Library of Congress, a guy named Todd Harvey, who did a wonderful book called The Format of Dylan. And what he did was to take the first 70 songs that Bob Dylan ever recorded, and he tracks their roots in the Anglo and African American tradition. And fully two thirds of them, the, the tunes are borrowed, are taken from some other context. Um, and uh, in this same line, there was an interview with Dylan in the LA Times some time ago, and Dylan describes how he writes. He says, I'll take a song I know and simply start playing it in my head. I'll be playing Bob Nolan's Tumbling Tumbleweeds, for instance, while I'm driving a car or sitting around. At a certain point, some of the words will change and I'll start writing a song. That's the folk music tradition. And he says, the times they are changing probably came from an old Scottish ballad. But actually, this guy, Todd Harvey, he says, no, it's not. It came from a 19th century American. <laughs> Dylan doesn't know where he got his own stuff. But. So, and maybe the most striking example of Dylan, um, this early receptivity, is the time that his girlfriend takes him to hear the Three Penny Opera, the Kurt uh, Brecht, uh, I mean, the Kurt, Bertolt Brecht, Kurt Weill Opera. 
And the song that knocks him out was the show-stopping ballad, Pirate Jenny. In the memoir, Dylan offers a long list of early songs. He says, if I hadn't heard Robert Johnson when I did, if I hadn't heard Pirate Jenny, I might not have dawned on me that songs like these could have been written. So, and in this context, so Dylan is outlining this long list of things that helped him become the person he was, is, and um, in this context, he recites a famous line by the French poet Arthur Rimbaud, and the line is, I is someone else. Dylan says, when I read these words, the bells went off. It made perfect sense. I wish someone would have mentioned that to me earlier. <laughs> so this, this line, I is someone else, it comes from letters that Rimbaud writes. You know, Rimbaud was a child genius, and even as a teenager, he was making poems that still are with us. And he wrote to an older uh, teacher of his uh, what are called the seer letters, S-E-E-R, meaning somebody who wants to be a prophet. And, um, and in those letters, at one point, he says the following. He says, I want to be a poet, and I'm working to make myself a seer. It's a matter of getting to... The, uh, the unknown by the derangement of all the senses. One must be strong to be born a poet, and I know that's what I am. It's not at all my fault. It is wrong to say, I think. One should say, I am thought. I is someone else. Too bad for the wood that discovers it's a violin. I is someone else. Too bad for the wood that discovers it's a violin. Okay. And too bad for the ego's pretensions to self-mastery and, and self-creation. This is, you know, he's, this is not a self-taught person, that's what he's saying. Because no solitary imagination gives birth to song any more than a spruce tree uh, gives birth to a violin. That being the case, so then Rambo sets out to attack the romantics. He calls them idiotic generations, one-eyed intellects, and old imbeciles. And he says they discovered only the false meaning of the ego. So what is the false meaning of the ego? I think for, for Rambo, the distinction between the true and the false ego hinges on this, the doubleness that's preserved when the I refrains from appropriating its own creations. So, so Rambo gets rid of the normal syntax um, by which the subject quickly owns its object. So instead of saying, I think my thoughts, you say, I am thought. Instead of saying, I think, therefore I am, you say, if you haven't lost your place, I am thought, therefore I am not. Or at least I is someone else. So who or what is this someone else? Um, often in Rimbaud, uh, the not I is simply the unknown. And, and, and then he imagines the poet as being like the thief of fire who um, is able to go out and steal from the, from the unknown, uh, from the gods, and make something his own. Um, but other times in the letters, uh, when he speaks about the unknown, well, other times he says the, the thing from which he gets it is what he calls universal intelligence. So maybe Rambo's not I is a version of the inherited tradition of art about all those who came before. And that's certainly what it is in the Bob Dylan autobiography. The not I is this surrounding world. Um, and he cites Rambo in the, in the midst of um, naming all these debts. There's a wonderful, you know, when you try to think about these things in terms of property or what you own, um, uh, there's a thing in John Locke where Locke is trying to imagine what property is. And uh, he says, well, it's what you mix your labor with. And he imagines a place that's completely empty. He calls it America. <laughs> and you go to this completely empty place called America and you build yourself a log cabin. And so you've now mixed your labor with these trees and so forth, and now you own the log cabin. It's now yours because you've mixed your labor with it. And uh, so this is um, the, the labor theory of property, and uh, you know, it makes a certain sense. <laughs> um, there's a, a philosopher named Robert Nozick who uh, 
He says, well, how does this actually work? How much do you have to mix with something before it comes, becomes yours? Like if I have a can of tomato juice and it's mine and I mix it with the ocean, now do I own the ocean? So, um, all right. Um, so look, I want to close by, I want to come back to one of the things that Bob Dylan says at the be that I read to you quickly, but now I'm going to read it more slowly. He, he says when he was reading these, um, when he was listening to these records of Woody Guthrie's, uh, they, he says, they made me feel more like myself than ever before. So that's a very strange assertion. So you have this 18-year-old kid who listens to somebody else's music, and now he feels like himself, and he hadn't felt like himself before. <laughs> So what is this self that comes forward in the presence of somebody else's art? Or more broadly, what is the self that only comes alive in its individuality, in the, in the full surround of other beings? And to retrace the steps of this talk, if you think about the ox herding series or, or what the Buddhist might say, it's the self that has forgotten the self and thus is actually in a different way at home in nature and among other beings, other sentient beings. Where's page 24? <laughs> I could do this off the top of my head. But... It's the self that's lost its last page. Here it is. <laughs> so if you go back to the ox herding series, it's, it's the self that's forgotten the self. To these microbiologists, it's the self that's like a coral reef, a cluster of interdependent life forms. To people like Benjamin Franklin or Thomas Jefferson, it's the self that has inherited the commonwealth that trades in things like air and light and song, and thus things that nature has made incapable of confinement or exclusive appropriation. If it's Martin Luther King, maybe it's the self that arises in the call and response, that something else comes into being in the call and response that didn't exist before. So it's the common self. You is not alone. That's my talk. <laughs> so we have time for questions and there are people with microphones and somebody else is gonna lead this. Thank you. Um, hello, Ms. Hyde. My name is Sonny, and I actually attend Art Institute of Chicago. Hello, everybody. Um, <laughs> hey, Sonny. Hi. <laughs> My question is, you were talking about um, just the creative process and getting things out and the artistic mind. But one of my questions is, we, we have so much information every day, and we're constantly being inspired by something or someone or what, whatever it may be. But what do you do in the case of having so much inside, you know, so much inspiration, this want and this need to get these things out to help, you know, if it's this lady here or that gentleman there, yeah. but to just, yeah. my, my whole, it just, it was very fascinating what you were talking about, but one of the things I yeah. <laughs> struggle with is how do you get everything out to help other people to also help yourself? Well, in a way, there's two different things you're talking about. One is uh, we feel swamped by all the stuff that is around us, and so it almost as if it's overpowering. And how do you how do you make sense of the incoming material? And then also, when, if you have a plethora of stuff inside yourself, how do you get it out? Is this right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I think there's a rhythm of creative life, and you know, to go back to this. I said it's a false question, really, to ask whether creativity is individual or collective. And I think it, it goes in phases, and that you need uh, to isolate yourself. And um, in a certain sense, you can never get away from your individuality. Things come with you. 
uh, anyway. But um, I mean, I, I just tell you in my own practice, uh, periods of solitude matter. That it it um, it it matters to go off and when I say for my own writing, what I need is time and enclosure. I need the sense that I have enough time to do the work because sometimes it takes me a day to write a paragraph. And, and then I need enclosure in the sense that I need to be not distracted. So, you know, there are phases in which uh, you're, you're getting stuff coming in and you're loading yourself up with all the material of the world, but you also need to, to be able to retreat. Um, who is it who says, uh, you know, go, you go into the studio and, and then everybody is there with you, all your teachers and all the, our histories with you and all the masters have taught you. And, and uh, if you're lucky, they slowly leave the room. And then if you're very lucky, at the end, you leave the room. <laughs> and you're there, something else is there making the work. So at any rate, I, that's my answer. Um, uh, <laughs> Robert Bly used to say, you know, for every line of poems, you ought to spend uh, about six weeks all alone in the cabin. So <laughs> that's, um, so I, I, even though I'm praising individuality and the common self, uh, but even in solitude, you, you are individual. So that's my answer. Is it me? <laughs> I as <is> someone else. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you for a beautiful, beautiful lecture. Um, I, I appreciate uh, your explaining to us the um, Old English root of privacy and uh, elaborating on this word to prive. Um, but I'd like you to comment a little more on privacy. Um, I, I guess a couple of weeks ago, I saw the Edward Snowden film and I think it was Snowden in the film who says, um, freedom of thought requires privacy. Yeah. That we can't um, really know what we think unless we have the privacy to explore that. Yeah. I'd wonder if you could comment on that. Yeah, well, it's true. I mean, maybe the question is about it agency, <clears throat> you know, who is in charge of whether you are privated or not. And in the examples I gave, of somebody who's lost a loved one, or somebody being forced out of public office, or somebody being forced into solitary confinement, these are not people who are in charge of, they're forced into privacy. Um, this language actually comes out of, uh, I got it from Hannah Arant's book, The Human Condition. And, um, uh, you know, part of her argument actually is that we, uh, that the human condition is plural, that we really become fully human when we can be in the public sphere as artists or as philosophers or as political actors and so forth. But I think the agency piece of it is important. And um, her other sphere is, is the sphere of the home where uh, you're, your, your biological needs are taken care of, where you're fed, you're nursed back from health if you're sick, uh, where, you can, where you die, where you're born, you know, that sphere matters also. Um, uh, you know, and of course the whole import of the Snowden affair is that we as Americans are not in charge of our own privacy if somebody else is keeping our phone records. So I think the hinge is around agency. And the, the right to privacy is a right to, to have be, you are the person who decides uh, when you're gonna prive yourself or not. Uh, it's not the state. And actually, I mean, just to say again, you know, I use it in the context of what happens to Martin Luther King because, um, you know, it's King's uh, son, Dexter King, who's in charge of the estate. And, you know, I don't know what his issues are, but, but uh, he has prived his father. You know, he has taken this public being, um, you know, he harasses, he has, they have harassed people who try to do uh, scholarly work on King. And they've commercial, you know, the, the Eyes on the Prize people had a lot of trouble getting the rights to use uh, clips from the, uh, the, the, the dream speech. Um, you know, that's, that's the priving that's of concern to me here. And, um, 
and, and the way in which American law uh, gives the right to exclude in perpetuity now to the owners of these cultural properties and uh, makes it harder and harder to be uh, an actor in the cultural commons. Hi, um, that's actually my exact question is the converse of this notion of privacy because um, these ideas, these cultural property ideas have ramifications in policy and right now, as I'm sure you're aware, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, if passed, could have some pretty huge ramifications on what is owned publicly and what is not. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak more to um, policy in public ownership of ideas and how that's quickly changing in our internet-based society and what, that, um, what your opinions are on that. Tell us what the TPC is. The TPP, uh, the Trans-Pacific uh, Trans Partnership, uh, is um, a piece of legislation uh, attempting to be passed by the Obama, Obama administration. I don't know everything about it, but essentially it's trying to um, take ownership of ideas as produced by Disney and so on and put further restrictions on uh, who can then do anything with those ideas and, and how people own them, privatizing yeah, them further. Yeah. So I don't know this particular case, but the words trans-Pacific tells me what it's about. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, what's, you know, since the first copyright law is 1710, and um, by the way, I am pro-copyright. I think copyright is a useful tool of public policy. I think that creators ought to have a monopoly privilege for, for a period of time. The puzzle is how, what, what the period of time should be. And uh, the original term was 14 years, and if you were still alive, you could get another bite. So it was up to 28 years. And at the founding of the nation, this country, that was the same. And I think that's good. I think even, you know, your lifetime, 50 years, whatever. But, but what's happened is um, both what's owned and the range of the length of ownership has extended uh, exponentially since then. And the thing that got me ticked off and began my work on Common as Air was in the middle 1990s, the Congress, in the same way, the Disney people and others went and asked for 20 more years of the term of copyright. And they wanted it retroactively because all the work that had been made in the 20s and 30s was about to enter the public domain, which was part of the original deal that, uh, in the Constitution, that, that the public domain matters just as uh, the short-term monopoly privilege matters. And a lot of us thought, you know, this is nuts. And it, and, and it goes against both what the founders thought and the language of the Constitution. This went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the court sadly said, you know, this looks to us like a stupid law, but it's not our job to decide, it's the Congress's job. So um, then what's happened is um, all of this is now international. And so um, the fact of the matter is that countries which are intellectual property poor tend to like to be pirate nations and import things and not pay for them. And countries which are intellectual property rich like to have strong rules and a lot of policemen to go out and enforce them. So this country, our nation, was for 100 years a pirate nation. From the founding of the nation until 1896, we were a pirate nation. We honored no foreign country's copyright laws and uh, we printed all the books we could get from Europe and sold them cheaply and uh, we're proud of it. So now we have switched and we're on the other side and when other nations do that, uh, we're ticked off at them. And, and uh, more than that, what we would like to do is, is to export our property laws to the rest of the world. Um, when uh, uh, Mr. Bremer left Iraq after the Iraq war, we left in place revisions of Iraqi law which changed their intellectual property laws so that uh, genetically developed seed lines are now owned in a different way and uh, public recitations of the Quran can be copyrighted. I mean, it's, so that's what's going on. And um, I'm actually kind of pessimistic about our attempt to fight this, but at least we should know what it is. And, um, uh, and there have been some useful pushbacks. Um, I mean, the most useful to my mind is what Lawrence Lessig and others have done with Creative Commons licenses. The, these are, are ways in which we take copyright law and essentially you say, I own this thing, but I'm going to release it to the public to use as it, whatever they want. There's a whole different set of ways you could do this, but it's an attempt to, to find the middle ground between uh, the, the power grab that we're seeing from the content owners and the, the rest of us who think there should be some cultural commons.
Okay, hello. Um, Somebody else want like to push to one of my buttons? <laughs> stand, I have to stand up. Oh. Is there... Okay, th this is my body, yeah. I would like to ask you, um, could you speak more on your ontological equation of Dr. King and Mickey Mouse? And could you commit to a fundamental difference or commonality between those? Yeah, I, I, I tend not to use the word ontological, but I, I do know what it means. Um, <laughs> Michael Walzer has a wonderful book called uh, um, Spheres of Justice, I think. And um, he says, look, we have all these different realms of social life. There's the church, and there's the army, and there's education, and there's family life, and there's the marketplace, and so forth. And um, he says, one simple definition of tyranny, which he gets out of Pascal, is the, uh, the domination of one sphere of social life by another. And so um, in a theocracy, the people who run the church get to run everything. And, uh, and Walzer and others think, you know, that's a problem. That begins to be tyrannical. Now your family life is dominated by the church. The marketplace is dominated by the church. Or in a military dictatorship, everything belongs to the military. Uh, in, um, in a plutocracy, the rich get to buy the election. Um, so so this, is, this is a sense of tyranny. Or the example that, that I use in this context is the way the entertainment industry has gone to colleges and asked them to police their students as if the students were in the marketplace for entertainment, which sometimes they are. But in fact, the ethics of a community of scholars are different from the ethics of, of, of Disney World. So this is what I mean partly by a, a way of being human. You know, how do you identify yourself? So maybe you are a merchant, or maybe you're an army person, or maybe you're a uh, priest in a church or whatever, but these are different roles, and they need to be protected from being dominated by other roles. And so what you see in the King case is um, the tyranny of the marketplace uh, taking something that belongs actually to a different sphere of social life. It belongs to the church and to political activism and making it into a commercial, into a commercial being. So there is an ontological dis distinction between these two categories. It's a category mistake um, and it's a form of tyranny for one of them to dominate the other. Hi, um, so I would like to keep going with the um, King reference here, but uh, my question is more about the call and response. About call and response, yeah. Call and response, yes. So um, you made mention um, of finding these bunnies in the crowd in order to stimulate um, energy and growth that helps King um, form his speeches and activate his mission. And so um, as an artist, I also use call and response. And what I find is that sometimes the bunnies take over, <laughs> um, which I enjoy because they create some really interesting experiments for me to play with. Um, but I also find that sometimes that can give me lack of focus. So yeah. I would like to know um, if you have any stories or theories or advice for a practicing trickster to uh, use this uh, type of tool in order to improve her own practice. Thank you. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, you know, I suppose, you know, at the end of the day, you have to flip back to being an individual and kick out the bunnies that don't matter. <laughs> um, but it is, you know, so again, there are phases in this. And at one phase, you suspend your control over what's happening. This is what improvisation is about. And also about, you know, true dialogue. And, um, you know, I, I, I teach creative writing. and, and one of the things that happens in creative writing workshop, part of the privilege of it is that you get to be in a room with a dozen other people who've read your work and you hear how they heard your work and you're surprised that they didn't get it and, and, and that they misread this and they misread that. And then you also get conflicting advice. Somebody loves this thing and somebody else hates it. Um, so at the one, on the one hand, you have to suspend your own judgment for a while and let these informing voices come in and see how the work begins to get reshaped by being bombarded by otherness that's not, you are no longer in control. But then you go back, you know, when you go back to your room and you make the final draft, 
uh, you have to decide what's, what, what thing uh, you're going to carry forward and how to shape it. And, and certainly King does that. You know, I, I, I'm sure there were some drunks in crowds he addressed. And, you, know, he, uh, you know, he chooses, um, but he's choosing what has resonated. So uh, he's not alone. And, you know, what, what he's choosing has already been made by this combination of self and other. Yes, it is. What? Yeah, I'm getting a sense of the individualist pushing back against me here. Uh, he is choosing, but but again, it's the puzzle of what he is. I mean, you know, what is the self? Yeah. <laughs> Let's do a, a week-long silent meditation and then have this discussion again. I mean, I agree that there's, you know, there's always an ego that comes forward, but um, uh, I think it comes forward more humbly or um, with a sense of the fragility of things, that th there's a lot more transience than we thought, uh, that things happen. Um, and uh, if you're John Cage, you learn how to work with what happens. Hello. Um, I'm interested in the kind of suspicion around the idea of privacy in society and how you think that affects our ability to connect with strangers in our daily life. And what do you mean by suspicion? Just, and like you talked about agency and kind of fragmentation that we experience in um, like capitalism, <laughs> you know, the, the system that we function in and how like we value our agency and we want to hold on to that. But I think that creates this fear of connection with people that we don't necessarily have a background with. Yeah. Um. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it becomes a big problem in a, in a big city where you're suddenly, you are surrounded by, I mean, what I'm thinking about actually is um, the word confidence man <laughs> is an American invention. That phrase does not appear until about 1849 when a guy shows up in New York City uh, asking, chatting people up and asking to borrow their watch and saying he'll return it the next day. And, um, and then he doesn't. And there's a newspaper article about this, and they call him the confidence man. And uh, then Herman Melville reads this newspaper article, and he writes a long, complicated, and um, confusing book called The Confidence Man. But, but what you learn in, 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 in the Melville work and from this is, is that when you're surrounded by strangers, the problem of how to read them is more difficult. That if you come from a little town where everybody knew each other, for generations and you all go to the same church. You know how to read people because the contexts are always the same. But um, in a mass society, we're constantly decontextualized. And, um, and the problem of how to place your belief, when should you believe the story that somebody else has tell you, is much more complicated. And you need to become a better reader um, of, of other people. Uh, this in a way goes back to the, my work on the trickster figure because Hermes is one of these boundary crossers. And Hermes is, is imagined as the character who can move from town to town and country to country. He's the god of the roads. But when you do that, you actually end up moving from one language system to another. And so you have to be able to speak multiple languages. And so Hermes becomes a translator. And the hermeneut, this is a term that comes out of the mythology of Hermes. The hermeneut is the person who is able to translate. But then hermeneutics becomes the art of interpretation. And it's the art of being able to read what you couldn't read before. And um, I don't know if this relates to, to privacy, but it is, it is the problem of being in a world where you constantly are, have the context stripped away and you need to become a better reader of the world, for which you should go to a great art school. Austin, my name is Waller Austin, and I'm a student at SAIC as well. 
Um, I thought it was really interesting how uh, you spoke about Dr. Martin Luther King and uh, and the whole big 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 business tyranny regarding um, licensing of intellectual property. Um, I, I have read some kind of scholarly writing. It must have been over a decade ago regarding how uh, Dr. Martin Luther King actually um, plagiarized uh, the majority of his doctoral dissertation. And it's, it's actually hard to find uh, copies of that. Most of it's been like redacted. Um, I don't think anyone cares because of all the great things that yeah. he's done. Um, but speaking to that, I would like to know um, how you think that uh, individuals should uh, differentiate between plagiarism appropriation and uh, cultural and individual authorship? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so first of all, plagiarism, I mean, the term means taking somebody else's work without credit and then claiming it as your own. It also actually used to mean taking somebody else's slave and uh, uh, making them your slave. Um, and it's an ethical question. Um, and it's an ethical question in certain communities where the, the uh, valued thing is to um, make your own work and put your name on it and get credit for it and so forth. But it's not valued in all communities. And I'm gonna give you two examples. The one that's most amusing to me is in the legal community, uh, people plagiarize and happily so. At the Supreme Court level, when a case goes to the Supreme Court, people file friend of the court briefs. So they say, here's how I would argue this case, and here's all the stuff I think belongs in that. Supreme Court opinions often cut and paste without attribution from the briefs. They've done this for decades. And they do it because the law doesn't belong to anybody. And the language of the law doesn't belong to anybody. And the arguments you make legally don't belong to anybody. These are supposed to stand on their own. It's not a question of authority, of who wrote it. It's a question of the precedence and the reasoning and so forth and the, and the, and the data. Um, so that's a community in which there isn't an ethic against plagiarism because the material is thought of as different, differently than it is in an academy where uh, we imagine that uh, the academy has a more individualist sense of uh, the creator and, and the... Um, uh, questions of attribution. The other place that this happens, of course, is in religious life. Uh, that to be able to say the Lord's Prayer is not a plagiarizing of Jesus. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, in, in, all religious in all religious communities, uh, you know, accepting the scripture and uh, knowing sermons that other, you know, the fact is you identify them, they become you. That these are now your words. Uh, that, that you now speak them. And so, you're not plagiarizing, you are speaking the same thing. It happens to be the same thing that somebody else spoke, but it's not, you don't need to credit. Um, so, so there are different systems. Uh, there is a lot of work on, 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 on the question of uh, Dr. King's dissertation, and, and um, if you Google, you can, you can find it. And, and I don't myself have a position on it, except to say that this is a man who came out of the black church where uh, preaching was a communal enterprise. And, um, um, that's all I have to say. <laughs> one, last one last question. Way more pressure than I wanted, but... Um, <laughs> Better be good. <laughs> well, just as a... a, a well, that question was um, part of my two-part question, which is when, I, when you were talking, I loved your talk, and thank you so much, and it inspired a couple of half-thoughts in my brain that I was hoping you could kind of contribute or complete with your our collective being consciousness or whatever. Um, and the first thought was about this question of citation and a seeming paradox, which often citation, I was thinking of another example of one of the people you mentioned, Bob Dylan's Chronicles also being found to be like the majority of it lifted from other books <laughs> and not cited, um, you know, like huge sections and how sometimes citation can actually be a gesture of immense generosity yeah. because you're, yeah. you're, telling, you're helping other people, you're giving signposts to where your ideas came from and you're helping them go to the source. And I think right. for me it, that like, there's something at least pragmatically useful about 
attaching a name <laughs> to an idea. Yeah. Um, and so I wanted to hear your response to that. And then the second paradox half thought was comes from this idea, this this funny term, the communism of the rich, that David Graeber, the anthropologist involved in Occupy, came up with. That isn't it ironic that in our individualist capitalist economy, if you're wealthy enough or you're a big bank or corporation, you kind of help each other out in this very like you'll forgive debts, you'll give loans at low rates. And I was thinking during your talk that I wonder if there's enough that, that, that sort of people who have attained a level of cultural um, sort of excellence or, or they've, they've, they've penetrated, they've, they've had that moment that Dylan had. Um, they, they are down with all of this sharing stuff, but how many of them have a passion to let other people in? And, and uh, like just the sort of barriers to entry into this commons. Yeah. Um. So I'll answer the, I mean, in a way, your second question is, is the critique of, of the gift exchange stuff that I've done. You know, a problem with gift, ex, gift exchange tends to be to happen in communities, that there are people who share with each other. And I don't think it's just the rich. I mean, I think that's true what you said, but I think there are always other communities. Um, you know, in poor neighborhoods, people share with each other. Uh, I worked in Mississippi in the 1960s and uh, in the town I lived, worked in, um, you know, there was tr tremendous mutual aid and generosity. Um, but the fact of the matter is often uh, there's a sense of an in-group and an out-group. And, and these, these are the people we share with and other people we're not going to share with. And so if you're on the out-group, that's a problem. And in a way, it's the bridge to this other book I did on the trickster figure. And there's a wonderful moment in the Homeric hymn to Hermes. Hermes is this kid who's been born illegitimately and he's living in a cave with his mom. And, and uh, he goes out and steals a cattle and... She says, you're a bad kid. And, and he says, you know, if, if my father Zeus will not give me honors, I'm going to steal them. And it, it's, it's the language of the outsider who's not in the gift community and is going to find a way to get in. And um, so partly the way I read the Homeric hymn is um, a cunning agent of uh, figures out how to get into the gift giving group and change the rules so that he's now involved. Um, this business to go back to your first thing about attribution, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I feel that's a value, that attribution, um, you know, it's different. In a way, it's a matter of ethics. Um, and in this country, it's not a legal matter at all. And actually, in Europe, they have a thing connected to copyright called moral rights, in which you are supposed to give correct attribution, and you're not supposed to not misattribute uh, something and say, oh, he wrote that when he didn't. Um, and in the Creative Commons, uh, suite of licenses, one of the things you can do is to say attribution matters to me, or you can say it doesn't matter to me. You can make this choice. Um, and just to tell you two quick things, uh, on Dylan's very first album, there's a song called Baby Let Me Fall You Down. And uh, it's credited when it was first released to Eric Von Schmidt and Bob Dylan. Because at the beginning, Dylan says, this is a song I learned from Von Schmidt up in Cal." So the people at Columbia think, oh, okay, he learned it from Schmidt. So they, they credit it. Then it's five years later, and Dylan has become famous. And Eric Von Schmidt gets a letter from Columbia saying, you know, uh, you were the co-writer of this song, and we really need a contract on this. So could you please sign the following documents? And Von Schmidt is amused because he didn't write it. It's an old folk song that he got, you know, off a record from the 1930s. And so he writes back and says, you know, this is the lineage of this song. And, um, and besides, if you owed me royalties for five years, where's the check? Um, so I was interested in this, in how this story has played out. So I actually got myself a copy of the most recent pressing of uh, Dylan's first album. And there's a long credit list that basically gives the genealogy of this song. So um, it's one example of Dylan giving correct attribution. Um, uh, you know, it depends on, you know, if you're in the folk tradition, uh, actually, let me just close with, a, with the, the story about attribution that's most amusing. So um, there's a, a rock group in England called The Planets, and they did a, a, a CD, and their producer, a guy named Michael Batt, produces this CD. And the planets play two different kinds of music. Some of it's sort of classical and some of it isn't. So, so Michael Batt puts an, uh, a minute of silence on the CD to separate these two kinds of music. 
And as an homage to John Cage, he credits it to Cage and himself. So the credit line says Cage Bat. Okay. So then in Europe and elsewhere, there's this thing called mechanical royalties. And what happens is the mechanical royalty collecting societies look at the records and they say, okay, John Cage put out a new record apparently. <laughs> so John Cage's publisher starts getting checks uh, from the record company. Uh, and they, uh, they go to Michael Batten and say, what is this? And, they, and Michael Batten says, well, you know, this minute of silence I cut. So <laughs> the Cage's publisher took Michael Batten to court for copyright infringement <laughs> for stealing a minute of silence <laughs> from John Cage. <laughs> now, actually, this simplifies a little bit. What they were really, they actually, uh, it was a moral rights suit and the problem was the misattribution. They were saying you shouldn't credit Cage for this minute of silence, he didn't write it. Um, and, and, and they actually won the case. It was settled out of court, but Michael Bad gave them a check. Um, and I got into a correspondence with, with uh, John Cage's publisher about this, because I tried, wanted to understand the story, but what I really wanted to understand is the whole system is based on, the moral rights system is based on the assumption that when I make a work of art, my personality goes out into the world attached to my work, and it should be respected the way you would respect me. Okay, fine. The problem is that John Cage, his whole philosophy was based on getting rid of his personality. <laughs> that that, that he, he loved it if he could make a thing which had no mark of himself on it. So in a certain sense, well, the story goes on, but... <laughs> In England, you can still copyright a minute of silence, and you must correctly attribute it. Thank you.